Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Last week we began a 21-day season of prayer and some fasting as we unveiled this word for 2021, and the word was believe, believe. And we said that we actually believe that God is unpacking that as an acronym for us with each of the letters representing something. So the B, standing for building permission as we're praying for the opportunity for our spiritual family to build this building on this land we own on the 8 Freeway. The E, which is really what I want to focus in on today, is the word engage. And we said, we are believing in 2020 for every person in All People's Church to deeply engage in their relationship with Jesus. And then to re-engage with his church, with his body and the community. And you see, 2020 was a rough year for the church in America. There's some really painful statistics that you might have heard. I don't know if you know this, in 2020, uh, they're saying that one-fifth of Christian churches in America shuttered their doors permanently. So they closed down for good, one-fifth. Uh, one-third of church Goers, when surveyed, said that they had actually disconnected completely from their churches, both in person and online, just completely disengaged. And then the worst, most challenging, frustrating statistic for me is that 50%, 50% of millennials totally disengaged from their church completely, both in person, online, any kind of experience with small groups. Now, by God's grace, that's not what's happened in this church, so we're incredibly thankful. But we believe that God is calling us as the people of God to be engaged with him and to be engaged with his family, the church, like never before. That we need that more than ever in the challenging times that we're experiencing as a nation and the nations of the world. And so that's what I want to dive into. That's why we're doing this survey. But it's also... As I was seeking the Lord to say, God, would you give us, and we've, we've talked about this as a, a, a leadership because we want to address this in the nation and the nations of the world. God, would you give us some understanding of what's happening and what we believe that God is unpacking to us is there is not just one pandemic that our nation has experienced, which is a health pandemic that we're all familiar with, COVID-19, but there is also an equally dangerous pandemic for the heart or for the soul of our nation, and that is a pandemic of offense, a pandemic of offense. Today, I want to talk to you on the title, Overcoming the Spirit of Offense, because what we've seen in 2020 is an opportunity for every single person in our country, for every single one of us, to be deeply offended by something. Uh, Have you noticed that anyone's offended politically in our country lately. Uh, I, I think that most people have had some opportunity to be offended politically, but it's gone way past that. We've been offended economically uh, as there's been a global recession. We've been offended uh, ethnically. It's, Lisa's leading us into praying for that restoration and reconciliation. There's been tremendous offense. I've seen tremendous offense take place in homes as we were pressed together and and cloistered and lockdowns together, offense between husband and wife, offense between children and parents. We've seen offense between genders. We've seen offense in how we've responded to the health pandemic. Do I wear masks? Do I not want to wear a mask? Do you agree with vaccines? Do you not agree with vaccines? Do you agree with how this This state has done this, or this state, or this. There has been innumerable opportunities for offense, and with offense comes anger, bitterness, rage, and ultimately destruction. God doesn't want his people to live in offense. And in fact, he addresses that very clearly in Scripture. So this morning, I want to dive into that and give you some keys for overcoming offense. Let me give you my thesis statement first. Here's my thesis statement. The only way that you can actually become a mature Christian, live out your destiny in God, and grow in healthy relationships and community is by overcoming the spirit of offense. Now, what do I mean by offense? I know that there's several different definitions. 
Like an offense could be uh, a concerted war effort against another country. That's not what I'm, I'm speaking at. An offense could be like a capital offense when you break a law. That's also not what I'm speaking about. Today, what I'm speaking about when I say offense, I'm talking about the subtle offenses that affect us, or maybe not so subtle, but let me give you the definition. It's often the second or third definition if you looked up offense in the dictionary. An annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. Someone does something that annoys you, you feel disregarded in what you stand for, you believe in, and so all of a sudden you have a resentment towards that person. I believe that every single person within the sound of my voice today has had something that you've been offended by in 2020. Can I get an amen? And so I believe that it's pertinent that we address this because I believe offense is eating up the church from the inside out. The first offense I want to talk about, I would encourage you to take notes. As usual, I'm going to address the three common offenses that are assailing us as the people of God. The first offense is actually offense with Jesus. Offense with Jesus. Offense has been around a long time, although it's coming clear on the radar screen in 2020, 2021. The Bible clearly addresses this topic, and so we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 11 with someone who is actually very close with Jesus and what Jesus said to them. Matthew chapter 11 talks about John the Baptist, and it says this, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, this is, remember John the Baptist, there's several Johns in scripture, so when John the Baptist heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples, so John had some followers, and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, if you've ever read the Gospels before, this is incredibly intriguing because you know that John the Baptist was specifically appointed to be the forerunner of Jesus. He actually had this divine calling. An angel showed up to his dad and told him, this child and your wife who's too old to have a kid, his purpose is to be one who goes before. He's going to fulfill Isaiah 40, be a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And so John goes, grows up this very set apart life. And if you remember, he's leading this revival out in the desert, the Judean wilderness. He's baptizing all these people. And he's the one who Jesus shows up, and when Jesus shows up, John, the most definitive declaration up to that point says, behold, the Lamb of God. He's looking at Jesus. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John was proclaiming beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one who's going to save the world. And then he, said, he goes on to explain some other things. Hey, I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals he said, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Like, he actually has authority to baptize you with the power and the fire of God. So what the heck is going on? That was Matthew 3. What the heck is going on in Matthew 11 when John's sending his guys and saying, hey, um, okay, I'm totally confused. Can you go back to Jesus and say, like, hey, are you the Christ? Like, are you, John, you're the one who proclaimed it to the world like it's in the Bible forever because of you. Why are you so confused? Here's why he was confused. You see it right there in that scripture. John said this from prison. I want to propose to you today that the reason John was so confused is because his life didn't go the way he thought it was going to go. How many of you Christians can say that today, that your life hasn't quite gone exactly like you thought it was going to go? Because I, I want to propose to you today that actually in American Christianity, we often have our own kind of American prosperity gospel that we subtly believe that if I give my life to Jesus, life is going to continually be up and to the right. I'm going to get more and more and more money. I'm going to get more and more and more comfort. I'm going to be more and more and more popular. If I really follow God, my Instagram account's going to grow, right? I'm going to have a lot more views on TikTok. 
I, I, I'm going to be a lot more popular. I'm going to get better looking. My health's going to get better. My bank account's going to get fuller. I'm going to get better vacations, right? That, that I'm going to live in green pastures. And, and John, man, no, guys, no one followed Jesus more than John. No one lived a more, I mean, I'm sure John was like, what the heck? My whole life has been about you, Jesus. Like, I mean, look at my outward appearance. I took a Nazarite vow. I don't even cut my hair. Like my hair, I can't have an undercut like Stephen. Like I have this long hair out in the wheel. I don't get to wear skinny jeans and, and deep swoop neck shirts because I'm wearing camel skin for crying out loud. I don't get to go to all the trendy foodie restaurants. I eat locusts and wild honey in the desert. Like, no one's giving their life more. I don't get to stay in this cool downtown apartment. I live in the desert. I stand in the water all day. And so John is like, what the heck? I'm in prison. This is, I'm totally confused. I thought, I thought following you was going to make my life be up and to the right. In this world. And so you got to see what Jesus says. He's like, Are you the Christ? And Jesus says, Now go tell John, watch this. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the power of the good news is preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Underline that, circle that, brand it in your mind. Blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Jesus says the proof of me being God, the proof of me being good, the proof of me being your Savior, isn't your life getting continually more comfortable. The proof of me being God isn't your life going more like you wanted it or hoped. You getting more popular, you getting more rich, you getting more famous, you getting to do all the things you wanted to do on earth. The proof of me being the Christ is the power of God and the proclamation of the message. Does the proof is I'm living out Luke 4.18. Spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the favor of the Lord. So many are offended by Jesus because their life hasn't circumstantially turned out like they hoped it would. But it does not mean that Jesus is not on the throne. He's not the savior of the universe. He's not the ruling and returning king. But blessed, he says, is he who's not offended by me. There is so much offense in the church towards Jesus. And I want to propose to you today that you can't grow in your relationship with God. You can't be close to Jesus. You can't grow into who you're called to be, and you certainly can't grow in community if you don't pass numerous offense tests. Let me just tell you, When you go to school, you have to take tests. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to go through tests to become more mature, to become who you're called to be. So let me just give you a little testimonial from my life. Just maybe you'll read into the story some and and see parts of your story in it. I remember when I was a, a high schooler and uh, you know, I, I, I was a part of church, but I have one foot in church and one foot in the world. It was really my first offense test now as I look back on it. I received a letter. I received a letter from a guy a year older than me in the youth group. I was in our church's youth group growing up, and he wrote this letter to me, and he said, Robert, you call yourself a Christian, and you say you follow Jesus, but you live like a pagan. This is an actual letter. Like, I got it in the mail. This is what it said. He said, you say you're a Christian, but instead you go and you party and you drink and you mess around with girls and you are, you are not living out what you say you live out. And I got that and I was so offended. I was like, you don't know me. And I pulled out a piece of paper and I wrote him back. I was like, how dare you judge me? How dare you say that you don't know me? You don't know my life. You don't know what I do. And I folded it up and I put it in an envelope and I went off and mailed it. And I walked back and I was 
so convicted by the Lord. And I thought, he's right. He's right. And that began the change in my life. I want to tell you one of the offense tests we have to pass if we're going to walk with God is other Christians actually confronting us on our sin. Can we be confronted on our sin, on the ways our life doesn't measure up to the calling of Christ and still walk with the Lord and still love other people? Now I thank God for that letter that that guy sent me. I get to college and I actually decide I want to start walking with God with everything in me. Like I want to be an on fire Christian. When we say on fire Christian, what does that mean? It just means like you are passionate about Jesus and you want to follow him with everything in you. And so then I knew if I was going to do that, I needed to go to a church. And I get to my university, Baylor University, and I immediately have an upperclassman warn me. She comes and says, hey, there's this one church, it's called Highland Baptist Church. I would be leery of it because I went and I, I listened to their music and I, I actually bought some worship music and all of a sudden it's all I wanted to listen to. Like all I wanted to do was worship God and I went away and, and, and sold all of my music that was about sex and partying and stuff. And so be careful. And I was like, okay. Yeah, I need, I need to be careful. And then I was thinking, like, wait, isn't that good that you got rid of all that stuff? But, but okay, I'll be careful. They're not going to get me. Have you ever been warned about a church before? <laughs> Why are so many of you, like, smiling and <laughs> laughing right now? So I, I, um, I end up going to that church, and, and, and these guys, they worshiped in a way that was offensive to me. Like they raised their hands, they danced around, they clapped, they closed their eyes. But guys, the the first time I ever went to their college group, um, a whole group had just come back from this thing called the Brownsville Revival. A quarter of a million people had been saved in one church. And so a whole group came back and the power of God was visiting that church. And so some guys get up on stage to give testimonial of that and they start talking about some visions they had at the church. Now, I immediately was offended because I was like, visions are weird. Now, they're in the Bible, but I was like, but that's weird. And, and what were the visions? The visions were of like Jesus in glowing white, I mean, straight out of the book of Revelation. But I was like, that is so weird. And then I remember a guy sharing, and he just gets overcome with conviction of sin, and he doubles over and starts weeping. And I am like, weird. I was so offended. I was like, God, how dare you do something that makes me uncomfortable in church? Hello? And I remember some people started shaking, like the power of God was touching. Well, I didn't know what it was, but they're shaking, right? And then some people actually fell on the ground, like they just kind of uncontrollably fell on the ground, and I, my circuits are being blown, right? I was a part of the frozen chosen. We sat in our pews, right? I mean, we were, we were you know, we're frozen chosen. And, and so I am weirded out, and then people are crying, and then some people, you see like their crying turn to this crazy joy, and they start giggling, and I'll never forget, my girlfriend looks at me, and she had this southern accent. She goes, Robert, how dare them laugh in my Savior's face? And I said, I don't know, Shannon, we'll get to the bottom of this. (laughs) And I committed that night. I was like, I am not going back. But those people, I was offended at God doing something that made me uncomfortable in church. The only way we're going to go forward with God is if we let God be God. And we let him do what's already in this Bible. Uh, fortunately, the, the college pastor called me the next day, and um, I said, man, those people were weird. They were doing weird things. It was offensive to me. And he goes, you know what? Um, I'm not saying that all that was from God. Yeah, there are weird people doing weird things, but we want everyone to be able to come to this church. And we want to create a place where people can meet with the living God. And sometimes God's a little bigger than our boxes that we put him in. And so we've just said, God, you come and do what you want here. And man, I was convicted. Because I was like, I don't think I've ever been in a church where everyone's welcome and where God is set free to be God the way he wants to, not the way that our human ordinances and religious observations dictate. Okay, going on. 
So I, I jumped in. It was pretty hard for me, but I jumped in, and I remember hearing these biblical teachings. And man, for the first time when I was hearing these teachings, they would hit me, like the power in the Word of God. When the, when the preacher would preach, it was so powerful. And I remember responding at the end to go up and get prayer, just like we do, right? Have the prayer team up front, and I went up to get prayer. And I'm going up, and there was a weird guy. Like, this guy was weird. And, and, and he came up and asked if he could pray for me, and I'm like, oh, man, not who I would have chosen to pray for me. And, and can I just tell you that weird people are going to be in church, right? You might be one. In fact, to someone, I guarantee you, you're weird. <laughs> to someone, you are the weird one. Um, and, and so this guy comes up, and, and he goes, hey, I want to share a word from the Lord, and I'm already skeptical. I'm like, I don't like words. I mean, well, I mean, I, I don't know. This is really weird for me. And, and he starts prophesying. And what he prophesied was wrong. He said, you have, you have a pornography addiction. You look at pornography all the time. You have this, all the sexual sin in your life. And here's what I knew. I was like, hey, I have sin in my life, but I've, I haven't walked in that in years and years. That is not what's going on in my life, and so I was offended that this weird guy came up and gave me a wrong word, and I immediately had to decide, am I gonna throw out all the gifts of the Spirit because someone exercised it in a wrong way? You know what I find is that God gives us an opportunity to discount things. God actually gives us a chance to say, hey, that, that's not real. He lets us be offended. God offends the mind to reveal the heart. Oh, man, so I had to get over that one. That was really challenging. Now, I came back, and, man, I got some amazing words that were spot on. So I'm going, and I'm finally starting to actually like these people. I'm getting used to this, and some of these people are nice, and I'll never forget that after one service, this guy came up to me and goes, Robert, can I share something with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. And he goes, I haven't liked you. I'm like, thank you. And he goes, in fact, I've really judged you. Thought you were just this big, cocky fraternity guy. And I'm like, awesome. And then he goes, but God has shown me that he loves you. I'm like, awesome. I'm thinking, like, I knew that God loves me, but now what I know is that you don't. <laughs> I had to get over another offense. Can I come to a place where people judge me and people don't like me? Can I still get over that offense and become a part of a community like that? What I find is in order for us to grow, be rightly fitted in community, and to live out our destiny, we have to have passed numerous offense tests. Here's a last one, but I've had numerous ones throughout my life. But here's one last one that happened that year. I ended up going on this mission trip to Juarez, Mexico, and I'm on this trip. And God was moving, and man, I saw my first people come to the Lord, first miracles, absolutely astounding. But one night we're having team time, and, and, and this, the Spirit of God was drawing people, and they started getting real. And it was too real for me. Like, they started confessing all kinds of sin, and I was offended. I was like, hey, <laughs> that's a little too vulnerable. That's a, I kind of like the Frozen Chosen, where we all said, there, hello, Brother John. Hello, Sister Sue. Isn't it a nice day? Lovely. I was offended by how real and vulnerable people were being. I want, I want to tell you that you have to learn to pass the offense test if you're going to walk with Jesus. You see, so many Christians, they come to Jesus just because he can give them something. We see that very clearly in Scripture. John chapter 6, you look at John chapter 6, and all of these, you know when the crowds showed up? The crowds showed up when Jesus was giving out something. So they came for the feeding of the 5,000. They came for the feeding of the 4,000. A lot of people were just like, hey, what can I get? What can I get? And so Jesus, man, he loved them. He blessed them. He let the children come to them. I mean, Jesus loves people. He loves crowds. But Jesus also does things that are offensive. Like he says to them, he says, um, so if you really want to be a part of me, uh, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay? That is not very seeker sensitive. Yeah, I've never seen a sermon series. I've never seen a mailer sent out, come to this church, eat my flesh, drink my blood. This Sunday. 
And so what do the disciples say? They say, that is a hard teaching because he didn't go on to explain it. Like what we know is he wasn't saying be a cannibal, but Jesus seemed to be okay totally offending people. And so the disciples say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then look at what it says in the end of John chapter six in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I think it's crazy that that reference is John 666. Will you overcome offense with Jesus? Maybe you had a health problem and you don't understand why you're afflicted with it. Maybe someone in your life died. Maybe something horrible has happened to you. Maybe you're bankrupt. Maybe you're just getting fired from your job. Maybe your relationship broke up. Maybe your, your family of origin has just broken up. Maybe you were, you were born, and even the, the, the way you were born, you were born out of wedlock, and you've never known your family, and so you're just like, I am offended that you would let this happen to me, Jesus. I'm offended by how things went, and Jesus says this, blessed are those who are not offended by me. In this world, you will have trouble. And the presence of trouble in your life isn't the absence of Jesus. He is good. And he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are calling according to his purpose. Jesus will take your greatest pain, your greatest sorrow, your greatest affliction, your greatest heartache, and turn it for your good. He will give you beauty for ashes if you will hold on and not be offended and not walk away from him. You have to pass the offense test with him. On the other side of offense is unbelievable friendship with Jesus. Number two, second offense. Second offense is offense with friends, family, or the church. Anybody ever been offended by someone in their family? Oh, okay. Um, anybody ever had a friend that offended them? Right? Yeah. Anybody been offended by the church before? Uh, by the end of this sermon, you're going to be offended by me. So, um, <laughs> Offense with friends, family, and the church. Can I tell you that every person will be offended? Jesus says this in Matthew 18. If another believer sins against you. If another believer sins against you. Why is Jesus addressing this? Because he knows it's going to happen. If another believer offends you, you will be offended by another Christian. It will happen guaranteed. He says if another believer offends you. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Okay, here's a key right here. If you get offended, the key is not going and getting on Instagram and blasting that person, going on Facebook and maligning them, going and gossiping to someone else. What does it say? It says, go to them. Go to them. The Bible says this, do everything you can to be at peace with all people. If the other person listens and confesses that you've won the person back. You know, Jesus is about building relationships. Jesus is about building friendship. Jesus is about working through challenges. If you're going to be a mature person, you're going to work through challenges. Here's the deal. So many of us, we get offended by someone, and then we break relationship. And so that relationship, all our relationships end very shallow because if you can't work through an offense, mature relationships have actually gone through the fire. Iron, beautiful jewelry is forged in the fire. If you don't have relationships that go through the fire and pass through it, you never have mature relationships. But the strongest relationships are one that have gone through the fire and survived and they're purified and they grow stronger. You will go through the fire. So you go to that person. Uh, let me just say it, it. You will have harsh things said against you. You will have people that gossip against you. You will have people that leave you. You will have challenges. But the point is we go to those persons and we do everything we can to be at peace with them. Now let me just keep going. Matthew 18, 16 through 17. But if they will not listen, take one 
or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, we often get this wrong. Someone offends me, and I immediately go to two or three people and gossip about them. No, it says, first, go to the person and try to work it out. Secondly, if, if you can't work it out, then bring some other people into it. Why? Because they help mediate the thing, so it's not just your voice against their voice, and we bring some level heads. And it's always about reconciliation. It's always about building. God's always trying to build. He's always trying to unify. Okay, then it says, if that doesn't happen, if they still refuse to listen, then tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Here's one of the greatest destructive lies I see the enemy doing in our generation. Because I hear about people saying this all the time. People say, I'm hurt by the church. I am hurt by the church. And what I want to say is, no, you're not. Because there's never been a person in this church that everyone got together and said, hey, let's all hate Johnny together. No, no, we've never done that. When someone says I'm hurt by the church, what are they hurt by? They're hurt by maybe a leader or a couple of people that, that they didn't like how they got treated. Sometimes it's valid. Sometimes, you know, people do sinful things. And so sometimes it's valid. Sometimes they don't like that someone confronted them on their sin. Now, let me just take a side caveat and say sometimes bad things have happened in church. Like I've heard of, by God's grace, not in this church, but I've, there's been people that have been abused in churches before. When that happens, that needs to be brought to the light. The church of God needs to be the safest place on earth. And so a church can talk about everything, okay? But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is someone who got their feelings hurt and they said, I'm hurt by the church. And I'm like, no, you're not. And so, they, so what do they do? So they leave, they don't just leave a church, they leave the, the capital C church. They're like, the whole church has hurt me. There's not a person in the world that the one billion Catholics on earth and the 980 million Protestants on earth got together and said, we don't like Jim. Let's go against Jim. And so they're like, I'm hurt by the capital C church. No, you were hurt by a couple people or several people in one church, but fight, don't divorce yourself from the people of God. Because when you do that, you remove yourself from protection, you remove yourself from healthy relationship, and you remove yourself from being able to live out your destiny because no Christian can live out their destiny apart from community. Uh, how do I know this? Watch. Just keep watching this. Matthew 18. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He's talking to the church. This is in the same thing. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them for my, by my Father in heaven. Why does God so want us to unite because when we do, there's power to release his kingdom on earth. He's saying, if you disagree with someone, that's why the enemy's always trying to divide us because he knows the power when we come together. And watch this. It says this, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with you. Why does God want to always pick people off and them to go, I'm hurt by the church, so forget the church. I just, I'm, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna follow Jesus but do it by myself because he knows that when you come into the, pres the people of God, he actually comes with his manifest presence. Guys, I have had hundreds of people tell me after the pandemic that when we came back together, we gathered back together, they were like, it's so good to be back because I just sensed the presence of God. Like, yeah, I could worship in my own home, but when we come back together, there's just something different. What is that? That's God with us. That's why Scripture says, do not forsake the meeting together. That's why it's time for America to go back to church. Not just so we can do some religious observation. No, it's because God's with us, and when we come together in unity and we pray, we extend God's kingdom. It changes life. It heals the sick. It sets the captive free. It delivers the addict from addiction. It stamps identity on the lonely and broken. It delivers people from suicidal spirits. It changes lives. Don't let the enemy pick you off from the people of God. It's one of his greatest assignments in this generation. Matthew 24 says the love of many will grow cold in the end times. Don't let your heart grow cold, but one of the greatest ways your heart can grow cold is because of offense. I talk to couples that are getting divorces 
And what do they say? They say, I just don't love them anymore. And I always find that there was something that happened where one of the spouses got offended. Offense pours water on the fire of love. Offense is like ice on top of a fire. And the love grows cold. Number three, the third offense that we're all going to have to address My last one, offense. The offense with our enemies. Every one of you will have enemies. There is no one that won't have enemies. You could be the most loving person in the world. Do you know that Mother Teresa had people that hated her? All she was doing was taking care of poor and broken people in Calcutta, India. People hated her. Some of you have heard of Billy Graham. Like, he's the most known Christian in all of America. And if you look up Billy Graham, he has more people hating on him as well. And the guy was just the most godly for Jesus person ever. No one can outrun having enemies. Even if your goal was to not have enemies, people would hate you because that's your goal. I, I, there are, every person, I've never met a person that someone didn't hate, right? You have enemies. That is something that you need to know. And the Bible says this, if anyone wants to live a righteous life, they will be persecuted. Like, if you just decide to believe that there's one God and Jesus Christ, his son, the savior of the world, you just believe that, there's gonna be people that hate you. Like, all you have to do is believe it. You don't even have to say anything. Then if you start saying it, you actually start doing what he says and proclaim it, then you're gonna have a lot more people hate you. Then throw in some prayers, then throw in some righteous living where you actually say, no, I actually believe that there's a moral way to live life. Oh my gosh, are you gonna be hated? You start actually standing by this book, you are going to be hated. Jesus said this. He goes, don't be surprised when they hate you. They hated me first. Let me just say, a mark of a mature believer is numerous people hating them because you're being like Jesus. Jesus is the most most Jesus-like person that ever lived. And he was hated and despised. And so Jesus goes through all this teaching, preparing us for people to hate us because he knew this is gonna happen. So Matthew 5, 43 through 48, it says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your, en- hate your enemy. That's what people used to say. But I tell you, love your enemies. Can you say that with me? Love your enemies. Say it one more time. Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Think about that person who's been the meanest to you, that's been the harshest to you, that's done you wrong, and God is saying today, will you love them? And will you pray for those who persecute you? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. You want that close, familial, daddy, daughter, daddy, son relationship with God? Then he's saying, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There's a special place of intimacy walking with me as your Father. If you'll do this, people, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. He's saying, hey, don't even murderous gangs that are trying to kill people and destroy people. They love their own people. Hey, there's nothing special if you just love the people that agree with you. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you go, that's impossible. And it absolutely is. And what he's not saying is, You have to live life without sinning. No, he's saying this. When you do this, you actually reflect God. Like when you actually love those who hate you and you pray for those who persecute you, you actually show the world the supernatural, unconditional love of God. You reflect the glory of God when you're mistreated and you respond in love. I believe this God is raising up a church in 2021 that will be marked by a love for their enemies and a prayer for those who persecute us. You will be persecuted. You will be hated. Will you respond in love? And as you respond in love, I dare you to start praying for the people that persecute you and start praying for your enemies and watch what God does in your heart. Why is this so important? Because if you hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness, It's like you're drinking your own poison and death every day. 
Bitterness poisons you. When you decide to hate, when you decide to be angry, have you ever met someone that's bitter? They're not a happy person to be around. They're not a joy. They actually suck the life out of a room. You feel slimed after you've been with them. Listen to what Hebrews says. It says this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Here's the problem. People are gonna hate you. You're gonna have enemies in your school, in your workplace, in your neighbor, your neighborhood, in some in your families. You're gonna have it. But if you choose to be bitter, there's a root that grows up, a root of bitterness. And what does it say? It says it causes trouble. What does it say? It says it defiles many. Do you know what? If you choose to be bitter at your enemy, it's going to make you, it's going to grow up, it's going to make you a bitter person, and that bitterness is going to affect your marriage. You're like, but I'm not bitter at my wife. No, but bitterness at anyone affects your whole life and defiles. It says a bitter root towards one person will grow up and defile many. I, 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 if not for you, I plead with you for us as a church, please let go of your bitterness because we don't need a bunch of roots defiling us. Get rid of your bitterness. Let it go. Forgive, release, pray for those who hate you. And what happens? You get set free. I've heard it said before that bitterness is like you drinking poison and hoping someone else dies. When you hold on to bitterness, you're just drinking a slow death, your own slow death every day. You've got to let it go. And there is freedom on the other side. The only person that your bitterness is hurting is yourself. And then it spews out of you onto all these undeserving people around you. You're not getting back at the person that you're bitter at. We've got to overcome the spirit of offense. And so here's how we do it. We do it through repentance and forgiveness. Would you stand up with me?